Grace and peace are yours from God our Father, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for our meditation this morning is the Gospel from Matthew chapter 4, which was previously read. There are a lot of intriguing things that we might see in this Gospel selection. But maybe the most surprising thing is what we see right away in verse 1, where it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But I think that to really understand the full impact of what's going on here, we need to back up a few verses to kind of see what happened just before this. Matthew records, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So this account that we focus on today happens immediately after Jesus' baptism. And at Jesus' baptism, God the Father spoke from heaven. He said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then it sounds as if Jesus barely even had time to dry his hair before the Holy Spirit is leading him out into the wilderness. And what's going to happen out in the wilderness? He's going to be tempted by the devil. And that maybe seems a little bit strange to us. I mean, why would the Holy Spirit do this? Why would the Holy Spirit, right after Jesus' baptism, immediately lead Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit. But the more and more I thought about this, the more I began to wonder if this is really all that different from what happens at any baptism. Think of your own baptism, for example. When you were baptized in the name of the triune God, God claimed you as his own dear child, whom he loves, in whom he is well pleased. But then even before the water was wiped off your forehead, you're sent back out into the world. Into a wilderness of sorts where you are going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted by the devil. Yeah, it might seem surprising that the Holy Spirit would send Jesus out to be tempted immediately after his baptism, but... Really, I don't think it's all that different than what's happened to you and me. So if you and I have spent our lives in the wilderness of this world, from the time of our baptism until now, being tempted by the devil, I think it's fair enough for, as, for us to ask the question, how have we been doing? Satan certainly brings many different temptations our way. And when a person is tempted, they face a test that generally they either pass or fail. If a person passes the test, they stick with what God says in his word, and they follow that in the way that they live their lives. Or if a person fails, they turn their back on what God says, they listen to the temptation, and they go their own way. Since we've faced this temptation, I think it's good for us to ask, how have we been doing? Have you ever been tempted to doubt God's providence and care for you? We hear the promises that God has for us in his word, promises that say that he loves us and that he cares for us and that he'll give us what we need. But then Difficulty comes along, and maybe we start to doubt. Satan is there with a the temptation, and he's there to ask us, did God really say that he would give you your daily bread? Because right now, it doesn't look like it. It looks right now like if you're going to be provided for, you would better do it yourself. So then sometimes we, we listen to that temptation, we take things into our own hands, and do things that aren't right. Like 
cut corners when no one's looking to make ourselves a buck or two. Or we take on one overtime shift after another to the point that it's unhealthy, to the point that we're sacrificing our relationships with our family or with our God. We go so far as to move money from our offering budget into our grocery or out-to-eat budget. And we justify all that by saying, well, if I don't watch out for myself, if I don't provide for myself, then no one else is going to. And when we take things into our own hands that way and fail to trust in God, we give in to the temptation. We sin. We fail the test. But even in those times when we do resist the temptation to doubt God's providence, even when we succeed in trusting God, then Satan is right there with another temptation too. Satan says, okay, you trust in God. Let's push the limits a little bit. Go ahead and live recklessly. Live however you want to without care of the danger it might cause. And all too often, we're, we're, we're too eager to listen to that too, aren't we? As we, we push the boundaries with our health, with our finances, with our time. And that's so often not even just limited to physical things, but spiritual things too. We figure we can put our God to the test and push the limits of his forgiveness. We say, I, I can sin just a little bit. I can do this thing God has told me not to do can cross this line because I know God has promised that he will forgive me. But when we live that way and, and when we put the Lord our God to the test, when we push those limits, that is giving in to temptation. And that is sin. And sometimes Satan comes at us with the most open and obvious of attacks says in no uncertain terms that we ought to just turn our backs on God and follow him and live the way that we want to live and we'll be better off that way. And so often the things that Satan tells us sound so good and we can be so quick to believe that if we just live the way that we want to live, if we live the way of the sinful world, that we'll be better off, we'll be happier and wealthier and have a lot more fun. Satan's promises sound good. They sound sweet. But they never deliver as promised. Just ask Adam and Eve about that. But the truth is we don't even have to ask Adam and Eve because we've been there too, haven't we? We know what that feels like. The shame and regret and guilt that results from turning our own way against what our God would have us do. When we do that, we give in to temptation, we fail the test, and we're guilty of sin. So if we're going to ask ourselves, how have we been doing here in the wilderness of this world as we face temptation? I think an honest answer would have to be a resounding, not very well. Not very well at all. Because when we've been faced with that fight against the devil and that fight against temptation time and time again, we have failed in that fight. So what do we need? We need someone to fight for us. And in Jesus, that's exactly what we've got. That's where Jesus steps in. Because Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And we see that truth front and center in our gospel lesson for today. So let's listen as we see how our Savior fights for us against temptation and against the devil. Because you see, Jesus was also tempted to doubt God's providence and care for him. It says, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. See, this temptation is reminiscent of the attack that Satan brought on Adam and Eve. Satan wanted Eve to doubt God's word and God's promise. So Satan came to her and he said, 
did God really say? And notice how he does basically the same thing here with Jesus regarding the words that the Father spoke at Jesus' baptism. Remember, at Jesus' baptism, the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son whom I love. And with those words still ringing in Jesus' ears, Satan comes along and says, If you are the Son of God, if you are, did God really say it? Did God really say that you are his Son? Because if that were true... Why is he leaving you out here in the wilderness unfed? No, if you really are the Son of God, then prove it. Prove that you are who God says you are and tell these stones to become bread. You see, Satan is the master tempter. He goes after a basic human need of Jesus. Jesus was true man, and he hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you even begin to imagine how hungry he must have been? And that's exactly where Satan tempts him. This was a real temptation for Jesus. When Satan came along and encouraged him to use a miracle and satisfy his hunger at the same time. But of course, it was about a lot more than satisfying his hunger. Because the real temptation was Satan was encouraging him to use a miracle to satisfy his hunger because he didn't trust his father to provide for him. So what was Jesus going to do? Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus answered Satan's lie with God's truth. Jesus said it's not just bread that sustains, but human beings need the promises from God's word too. And one of those promises is that God will provide for his children. And Jesus trusted that promise. Because he was trusted that promise, he resisted the temptation. He passed the test. But Satan wasn't done. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So Satan basically says to Jesus, says, Okay, Jesus, I've seen that you trust in your Father. Now prove it. Show how great your trust for God really is by throwing yourself down from here. After all, you say you trust him. And you know what? God even says that he will protect you and care for you. So go ahead and prove it. But Jesus would not take this misuse of God's word. He refused to push the limits. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus recognized that Satan is the father of lies, and that if he ever speaks the truth, even for a moment, it's only to misuse or twist that truth. And that's exactly what he did when he quoted God's word here. But Jesus saw right through this misuse of God's word and refused to push the limits. No, Jesus trusted his father but he would not put him to the test he resisted the temptation and refused to put his father to the test but even still satan wasn't done it says again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor all this i will give you he said if you will bow down and worship me There's nothing really subtle about Satan's temptation here. He wants Jesus to quit the fight that his father had sent him to win. He wants Jesus to take the easy way out. He's telling Jesus, hey, Jesus, avoid the cross. Avoid the suffering. Avoid death. All that discomfort. You know what your father has in store for you, and you know it's going to be painful. Just take the easy way out. Just bow down and worship me. 
<coughs> and then you'll have it good. So for Jesus, the choice basically became, am I going to choose the cross and my Father's glory and the salvation of mankind? Or am I going to choose my own glory without the cross? So what would Jesus do? Jesus chose the cross. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus did exactly that. Jesus worshiped and served the Lord God and him only. Jesus worshiped and served him to the point that he resisted all of these temptations that Satan brought and all that Satan would bring in the future. He resisted every single one of those temptations. Jesus and worshiped and served his father all the way to the cross. And he did that for you. See, Jesus chose the cross and your salvation over his own personal comfort and glory. You see, we needed a Savior to step in and fight for us against the devil. And that's exactly what we have in Jesus. Because everything you see Jesus doing here in this lesson, Jesus does for you. When you see Jesus here fighting against the devil and resisting temptation, Jesus does that for you. Understand what that means for your life. Just think about all the times over the course of your life that you have failed and given in to temptation. And of course, there will be way more than you can remember, but just think back for a minute about all those times that you've given in to temptation and spoken badly about others. Times that you've given in to temptation, to lust, and maybe gone places on the internet and you had no business going. All those times you've given in to temptation and said or done things that were disrespectful toward those in authority that God has placed over you. Any temptation. Think of all those times that you failed. What this lesson for you means today is that while you might be able to look back over the course of your life and see all those failures and all those times that you've fallen into temptation. Well, you might be able to look back at those. God does not. Because when God looks at your life, he doesn't see someone who has failed time and time again. He sees Jesus. He sees Jesus perfectly fighting for you. He sees Jesus perfectly resisting temptation for you and in your place. We needed someone to step in and fight for us against the devil. And that is exactly what Jesus has done for us. You see, Jesus is the one whom God sent to crush Satan's head. And we got to see today how Jesus fought and won against the devil in the wilderness. Over these next six weeks, as we gather for worship on Sundays, we're going to get the opportunity to see our Savior fight for us some more. We'll get to continue to watch that until six weeks from today. We celebrate how our Savior fought for us against the devil. And won by crushing Satan's head on the cross and rising victorious from the grave. You see, Jesus' victory over the devil is your victory over the devil. Because Jesus is your Savior who fought and won for you against the devil. Amen.